David Copperfield by Charles Dickens, Chapter 43, Another Retrospect. Once again, let me pause upon a memorable period of my life. Let me stand aside to see the phantoms of those days gone by me, accompanying the shadow of myself in dim procession. Weeks, months, seasons pass along. I have come legally to a man's estate. I have attained the dignity of twenty-one. But this is a sort of dignity that may be thrust upon one. Let me think what I have achieved. I have tamed that savage, stenographic mystery. I make a respectable income by it. I am in high repute for my accomplishment in all pertaining to the art, and am joined with eleven others in reporting the debates in Parliament for a morning newspaper. I have come out in another way. I have taken, with fear and trembling, in, to authorship. I wrote a little something in secret and sent it to a magazine, and it was published in the magazine. Since then, I have taken heart to write a good many trifling pieces. Now I am regularly paid for them. Altogether, I am well off. When I tell my income on the fingers of my left hand, I pass the third finger and take in the fourth to the, to the middle joint. We have removed from Buckingham Street to a pleasant little cottage very near the one I looked at when my enthusiasm first came on. My aunt, however, who sold the house at Dover to good advantage, is not going to remain here, but intends removing herself to a still more tiny cottage close at hand. What does this pretend? My marriage? Yes. Yes, I am going to be married to Dora. Miss Lavinia and Miss Clarissa have given their consent, and if ever canary birds were in a flutter, they are. Miss Lavinia, self-charged with the superintendence of my darling's wardrobe, is constantly cutting out brown paper cuirasses and differing in opinion from a highly respectable young man with a long bundle and a yard-long measure under his arm. Miss Clarissa and my aunt roam all over London to find our articles of furniture for Dora and me to look at, to find out articles of furniture for Dora and me to look at. It would be better for them to buy the goods at once without this ceremony of inspection. For when we go to see a kitchen fender and meat screen, Dora sees a Chinese house for Jip and prefers that. Peggotty comes up to make herself useful and falls to work immediately. Her department appears to, to be to clean everything over and over again. She rubs everything that can be rubbed until it shines, like her own honest forehead, with perpetual friction. And now it is that I begin to see her solitary brother passing through the dark streets at night and looking as he goes among the wandering faces. I never speak to him at such an hour. I know too well as his grave figure passes onward what he seeks and what he dreads. Why does Traddles look so important when he calls upon me this afternoon in the Commons? where I still occasionally attend for form's sake. When I have time, the realization of my boyish daydream is at hand. I am going to take out the license. I hope the next time you come here, my dear... Uh, I hope the next time you come here, my dear fellow, I say to Traddles, it will be on the same errand for yourself, and I hope it will be soon. I assure you, my dear boy, says Traddles, I am almost as pleased as if I were going to be married myself. And really, the great friendship and consideration of personally associating Sophie with the joyful occasion and inviting her to be a bridesmaid in conjunction with Miss Wickfield demands my warmest thanks. I hear him and shake hands with him, and we talk and we walk and dine and so on, but I don't believe it. Nothing is real. Sophie arrives at the house of Dora's aunts in due course. She has the most agreeable of faces, not absolutely beautiful, but extraordinarily pleasant, and is one of the most genial, unaffected, frank, engaging creatures I have ever seen. Traddles presents her to us with great pride and rubs his hands for ten minutes by the clock with every individual hair upon his head standing on tiptoe when I congratulate him in a corner on his choice. I have never seen my aunt in such a state. She dresses in lavender-colored silk and has a white bonnet on and is amazing. Janet has dressed her, and there is a look at me. Janet has dressed her and is there to look at me. Peggotty is ready to go to church, intending to behold the ceremony from the gallery. Mr. Dick, who is to give my darling to me at the altar, had his hair curled. Traddles presents a dazzling combination of cream color and light blue, and both he and Mr. Dick have a general effect about them, 
of being all gloves. The rest is all a more or less incoherent dream. A dream of their coming in with Dora, of the pew opener arranging us, like a drill sergeant before the altar rails, of the clergyman and clerk appearing, of a few boatmen and some other people strolling in, of an ancient mariner behind me flavoring the church with rum, of the service beginning in a deep voice, and our all being very attentive, of Miss Lavinia, who acts as a semi-auxiliary bridesmaid, being the first to cry, and of her do doing homage, as I take it, to the memory of Pidger in sobs, of Miss Clarissa applying a smelling bottle, of Agnes taking care of Dora, of my aunt endeavoring to represent herself as a model of sternness, with tears rolling down her face, of little Dora trembling very much and making her responses in faint whispers, of our kneeling down together side by side, of Dora's trembling less and less, but always clasping Agnes by the hand, of the service being got through quietly and gravely, of our all looking at each other in an April state of smiles and tears when it is over, of my young wife being hysterical in the vestry and crying for her poor papa, her dear papa, of her soon cheering up again and our signing the register all round, of my going into the gallery for Peggotty to bring her to sign it, of Peggotty's hugging me in a corner and telling me she saw my own dear mother married, of its being over and our going away, of my walking so proudly and lovingly down the aisle with my sweet wife upon my arm through a mist of half-seen people, pulpits, monuments, pews, fonts, organs, and church windows, in which there flutter faint airs of association with my childish church at home so long ago, of their whispering as we pass, what a youthful couple we are, and what a pretty little wife she is, of our all being so merry and talkative in the carriage going back, of there being a breakfast with abundance of things pretty and substantial to eat and drink, whereof I partake, as I should do in any other dream, without the least perception of their flavor, of my making a speech in the same dreamy fashion, without having an idea of what I want to say beyond such as may be comprehended in the full conviction that I haven't said it, of our being very sociable and simply happy, always in a dream, though, and of Jip having wedding cake, and it's not agreeing with him afterwards, of the pair of hired post horses being ready, and of Dora's going away to change her dress, of Dora's making a long series of surprised discoveries, and she, and she has forgotten all sorts of little things, and of everybody running everywhere to fetch them, of their all closing about Dora, when at last she begins to say goodbye, looking with their bright colors and ribbons, like a bed of flowers, of my darling being almost smothered among the flowers and coming out laughing and crying both together to my jealous arms, of my wanting to carry Jip, who is to go along with us, and Dora saying no, that she must carry him or else he'll think she don't like him any more. now she is married and will break his heart, of our going arm in arm and Dora stopping and looking back and saying, if I have ever been cross or ungrateful to anybody, don't remember it, and bursting into tears. Of her waving her little hand and our going away once more, of her once more stopping and looking back and hurrying to Agnes and giving Agnes above all the others her last kisses and farewells, we drive away together and I awake from the dream, I believe. It is at last my dear, dear little wife beside me, whom I love so well. Are you happy now, you foolish boy, says Dora, and sure you don't repent? I have stood aside to see the phantoms of those days go by me. They are gone, and I resume the journey of my story. And that is the end of chapter 43.